Hello there. Um, Jay's quite right. I'm a graphic designer, so communication is my business. Now, I use words a lot to get messages across, to make them as direct as possible. But English, it's a tricky language because it hoodwinks us into thinking that words mean one thing when they actually mean another. There's so much ambiguity, there's so much confusion, that it's a wonder we can actually communicate well at all. So this evening, I'm going to give you my dictionary of the English language. Now, this is going to be an A to Z of words that are a little bit poorly. They're not feeling very well. They're not operating at 100% um, power, basically. So like all good children, we know that an A to Z has to start with the letter A. Now, A is for anti, and A is for anti. Now, for years, I didn't know the difference between these two words. I thought antenatal classes were something you went to to learn about contraception. <laughs> but I've since found out that anti with an I is of Latin origin, and anti with an E is Greek. Anti with an I means against or opposed to, and anti with an E means before. So why is it? When we get to the Italian, antipasto, meaning before the main meal, Italian's a Latin language. Surely that should be instead of the main meal. Now, you try telling that to a hungry Italian. Not so good. That then takes us to B. Now, B, oh. How many words in the English language that as soon as you've said them and even used them in context, you still have to explain them? Bi-monthly, twice a month and every two months, and the same for bi-weekly and bi-yearly. So we use these words, and yet we have to define them as soon as we've said them. Why do we even bother having them in the dictionary? I think we should just stop using them altogether. Now, if Eng English wasn't confusing enough already, what happens when we have perfectly good words, like the word patient? which has been around for centuries. Now, there's a movement that says perhaps patients shouldn't be patients after all, but should be consumers. Now, this is quite a big political question. Do patients become more empowered by becoming consumers? Do doctors become providers? And does healthcare become a financial transaction like buying a car, for example? Well, I'm not really here to talk about politics, but one thing I would say is that we say that a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, I would say to you, be very careful, because one word can change the picture entirely. D is for drugs. Now, drugs, especially in the UK, is a word that's become a little bit edgy, and people don't like using the word drugs. I'm on drugs. <sighs> That's not good. I'm on medication. Come in, have a cup of tea, have some sympathy, <laughs> tell me all about it. Now, I think we need to take the horror out of the word drugs, and I think we need to kind of step back from it and make it less edgy. So I think from now on, when we say we're going to the pharmacy, we're going to say we're now going to visit the drug dealer and just take <laughs> the edge off the word drugs. E is for early. Now, when I hear early detection, I think, what does early detection actually mean? Is that Monday at 9 o'clock? Is that early enough? Or maybe now, Tuesday evening is fine, that's early. Or perhaps early detection is an age thing, so it's before you turn 25. Well, I'm none the wiser with early detection, but I do think it means that we know there might be, there might be something wrong with you, but we're going to know about it for longer. <laughs> F. F is for fever. We get a cold and we run a fever. Okay, so we've got a cold but we're hot. That doesn't really make much sense, but I suppose knowing that you have a fever, you have to know what normal is. Now, I don't know what normal is in Fahrenheit because in the UK we have the metric system, so I know that normal is 37 and a half degrees centigrade. So a fever is anything above that. Now, I've touched on metric here, and I want you to hold the metric thought until we get to M, which, as you know, is coming shortly. G, 
G, my goodness. G is for good. Now, good. When I hear the words, it's good for you, or it's going to do you good, why do I know I'm not going to like what's coming? <laughs> I immediately think, if it's for your own good, I'm not going to like it. So good has been completely made bad to some degree. H is for healthcare. If we take the letters in healthcare and we shuffle them around, we get ache healer. And how much more accurate is ache healer than healthcare? Because most of the time, we don't tend to look after our health really well. So we go to be treated for illness. So ache healer is far more accurate. We may as well start saying sick care, really. Now, impregnable. Whew. Impregnable means able to be made pregnant. Able to be made pregnant. But impregnable also means impossible to enter. <laughs> I have nothing more to say about that. Let's move on. <laughs> J is for jargon. This is the language that professionals have. Lawyers talk to lawyers, they use jargon. Doctors talk to doctors, they use jargon. But what happens when that jargon is taken out of the professional context and it's spoken in a non-professional environment? Well, then communication does break down. And we get to K when you're in an environment where a doctor is asking you about your symptoms and you don't really understand what he's saying, so you say it's kind of like that, yeah. So does anyone know the difference between a dull pain and a sharp pain? Mm, not really. Is your pain localized or generalized? Does that mean, do I feel it at home or when I, and when I leave the house? <laughs> I don't really understand. It's kind of like that. It's kind of like that. If all this wasn't bad enough, then we make up words. Now, what was ever wrong with light? <laughs> there was nothing wrong with light. But I suppose we could say this is a very clever marketing ploy, because light is like light, but with 25% fewer letters. <laughs> M is for metric, N is for nutrition, and O is for overeating. Now, I haven't been particularly English language specific in that I haven't said this is something we do in the UK or something you do in the, US, in the US, but I am going to get US specific now. I don't understand why on food labeling in this country, your nutritional information is given in metric. So fat content, carbohydrate content is in grams and kilograms, and yet the weight on the packet is in pounds and ounces. <laughs> How do you know if you're having too much or enough or you're overeating? You don't know because the language is a scientific language. How are you supposed to know? Why is it done like that? P, political correctness. Now, in the 80s, a word came over to the UK from the US, the word challenged, which was used to try and destigmatize or take any labeling aspect of any kind of condition or impairment. So blind became visually challenged. Now, I don't think challenged is a particularly uplifting word. In fact, I would say it's quite negative. There's always the argument about fat versus obese. What's the best way to say this word, to label somebody in effect? So is weight challenged really a good option? I don't think so. If you want something that's destigmatizing and is non-labeling, then don't say fat, don't say obese, don't say weight challenged, say calorifically enhanced. <laughs> Q, questions. If you don't understand, just ask. End of Q. R. R is for remission. Now, this fascinates me because remission actually means to stop or to cancel or to cut short, to put a stop to. And yet, when we have remission in a healthcare environment, there's a temporary definition that's also introduced. So, surely, to cut short 
or to actually stop would be cure, but it isn't. So why do we use this word remission when we've cut short or stopped something that may only be temporary? I think we need a better term here rather than remission. Now, S is for smoking kills. Now, <laughs> it's a, a subject. I've spoken about the fact that we don't communicate very directly, but I know here and also in the UK, health warnings on cigarette packets are incredibly direct. They couldn't be any more direct, but they still don't tend to work. So I would say, and this is my theory, we don't need health warnings on cigarette packets because when people tend to start smoking is when they're in their teens. And nobody wants to see health warnings when they're teens. You're going to live forever when you're a teenager. It's stuff that happens to other people, not to you. So to that end, maybe we need beauty warnings on cigarettes. So smoking makes your skin sag, maybe, or smoking makes your teeth yellow. Maybe it's not the health warning that's um, right in this particular instance. So it doesn't matter how direct it is, it's the actual message itself that's not right. T, two tablets by mouth twice daily. Now, instructions on medication, my goodness, they can be so incredibly complicated. They're never put particularly directly. You never know whether you're taking four pills in a 24-hour period or with 12 hours apart or whether it's just four straight off. And I read a case recently online about a chap who was having problems with his medication because he had to apply patches to his body. And he'd run out of places to attach these patches <laughs> because the instructions did not say the obvious, remove the old patch before you put the new one on. Oh, unlikely. If you want vague, then go for unlikely. As human beings, we like to evaluate things. So we want unlikely to be 60-40 or 70-30. Or on a scale of 1 to 10, is unlikely, number one, it's never going to happen. Or is it 10, it's definitely going to happen. So where does unlikely fit into that? But then perhaps unlikely is quite a good place to hide. And I'll get on to that in a minute. V is for vision. Now, I'm wearing contact lenses right now, but I have no idea whether I'm nearsighted or farsighted. I haven't got a clue. And I wonder about nearsighted and farsighted as well, because I think if you're nearsighted and farsighted, does that make you incredibly with supervision, perhaps, because they cancel each other out? Or does it mean that you're blind? or visually challenged, should I say. So nearsighted and farsighted is, is quite a tricky one, and I've yet to kind of establish which one I am, but it doesn't matter. I can see that's the main thing. W is for why didn't you say that? And we're back to unlikely now in this intended vagueness. Sometimes it's a good idea for doctors to use jargon or to use words like unlikely, which are slightly vague, because they're still investigating. They still don't quite know what the issue is. So there's an intended vagueness, not to make you feel um, in any way um, unknowledgeable about what's wrong with you, but just to kind of reassure you that you know, we're working on it and um, we don't know just yet. But nobody wants to hear a doctor say, I don't know, I haven't got a clue. So in those particular instances, a little jargon and a little bit of vagueness um, does a little bit of good. Now, X is for xylitol. Now, I'm not talking about xylitol in particular, but artificial sweetener. We know that artificial is bad. Natural and organic are good. So why is it that as a healthy choice, we add artificial sweetener to our tea and coffee? Why do we do that? And yet we always check the packet to make sure that there are no additives in our food, provided we can read the nutritional information table, that is. Um, so yes, I think as consumers, we're quite contrary from that point of view. <laughs> why is for you know what? Embarrassing illnesses. How do we refer to body parts in the doctor's surgery. Now, this is particularly difficult. At this point, we wish we knew some jargon, but we don't. So we start using euphemisms and colloquialisms. I'm having a little bit of trouble passing water downstairs. What? 
That kind of begs the question, we'll use the upstairs bathroom. <laughs> Extraordinary, really. Z. Z is for sleep. Now, if you're learning English, you can get very easily confused because some words that you think would have the same meaning don't at all. If a doctor says to you, take these two pills, they will get you to sleep, you can see you've got eight hours ahead of you of perfect slumber, you'll awaken refreshed, and all will be well. If a doctor says to you, take these two pills, they'll put you to sleep, oh, I, didn't, I wasn't expecting anything quite so permanent. <laughs> Completely subversive. So I suppose with Z then, there's no better place to end than with the big sleep itself. But I wanted to leave you with a one-liner that would kind of sum up my talk for you to remember. And I came up with two, and I thought to myself, I'll decide on the flight on the way over. On the flight, I still couldn't decide, so I thought I'll decide in the morning. This morning, I couldn't decide, and now on this stage, I can't decide. So I'm going to give you both. Now you know my ABC, you'll be just as confused as me. That's the first one. Not so good, didn't get much of a laugh, okay. So, now you know my ABC, don't forget, it's Z, not Z.